Good morning. It's good to be here to, to get today again. Uh, what I want to share today is I have shared this before a number of years ago, and I know me and Galen had shared a, a taste, a touch of this uh, in a joint assembly here. But as the, as the area of maturity keeps, spiritual maturity, as I keep uh, thinking on this, there's more pieces that keep coming to me. And when I get those pieces, I enjoy giving it to a group of men and ladies here so that you can help me discern if I'm actually processing it correctly. So that is my purpose of this morning, is to share this in a way that uh, if you see something that I'm not seeing correctly or should be adjusted, please let me know or let's have discussion about it. But this area of maturity, a spiritual maturity, um, let me start with this part. When you think of, uh, in First John, there's four different areas in First John. One is babes, one is little children, one is young men, and then fathers. And I believe in this passage you can put in um, men and fathers is not gender specific, but uh, more position than gender. You can put in the mothers, you can put in young ladies as well. But the question I want to give is, well, let, let, me get, let me read this passage first. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. For in Jesus Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Here Paul is saying in the Corinthians that there's a lot of people that are teachers, but not many fathers. The question I have right now is, is it any different for us today? Shane, you said no. Do we agree? Is it any different today? Do we have a lot of father, spiritual fathers amongst us in our community? I will make it as practical as possible. Not enough. Okay. That is a good question. Define a father. Let's process this a little bit. What does it look to be a father, for, to be a spiritual father? What does that look like? Okay, a father can reproduce. Any more thoughts? What is it? Now, when I say father, I want you to understand this could also be mother. This is not gender specific. This has to do with maturity, not gender. Re reproduction. And that has to do with fathers or mothers. What other is a characteristic of a spiritual father? Stability. 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 Okay. What else? Courage. Courage. An older person. But what I find interesting is maturity, spiritual maturity is not necessarily connected to age. H hang on a moment. We should... I want as much as possible. Could you repeat that comment? I agree with what you said, but I believe it's it's extra powerful if you find both, because there is. We know that mature Christians in age so often in our community does not go together. That's right. But 
if you find a mature Christian that is older, that even makes it more powerful. That is right. Any more thoughts? What are the characteristics of a spiritual father? Wisdom. Wisdom. Sacrificing for your children. I think one thing I see in parents, life is all about the children. When I, when I remember my mom, she put herself last all the time. It was always, do you have enough? Oh, there's not quite enough. Okay, here's, here's mine. Yeah, does that ring a bell to anybody? Yeah. It's all about the others. Yourself is kind of, and maybe a little bit to their hurt, I don't know. But their selves, honestly, is you to put on the last. So spiritually, when I look at that, is continuously looking out for the well-being of the baby, but especially a mother, everything is put aside when it comes to the babies. How about us? Do we care about the babies or do we get ticked off at the babies? Or oh, just grow up once. I never heard a mom say that about the babies. Get ticked off at them, just say, grow up once. I hear the opposite. Oh, they grew up so fast. That's what I hear. I, I'm repeating what I heard. Okay, I'm a, I live alone, so I don't know what it is to graze babies. But those are some of the comments I hear from moms. They actually like the little ones. How are we spiritually? Do we like the young the baby Christians, do we care about them, or maybe we're not even fathers? Maybe we're not, where are we? And I'm not sharing this for you to point around and say, okay, that one's a father, that one's a baby, that one's a little children. I'm, I'm more or less saying, evaluate your own heart. I'm amazed in scripture when you start stacking the verses on top of each other how pretty well expla explains each characteristic and I want to go through that and I'll allow you to judge who you are and the purpose is to encourage you to mature there's one thing that is different in spiritual maturity that is not in physical maturity. Physical maturity, you will get older, you will grow up. But in spiritual maturity, it's not that way. Just because you've been a Christian for 30 years has no guarantee that you're spiritually mature. It's actually no connection to it at all. To spiritual maturity and age does not go together. It should, but it doesn't. So now I'm going to look at some verses um, about babies. And I want you to discern, uh, see if you can see um, a pattern. Starting in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, and as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, and not with solid food. For, un for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you are still not able. For you are carnal. For where there is envying and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behave like mere men? 
For when I say, I'm a Paul, and others say, I'm a Paulus, are you not carnal? In, Ephe in Hebrews chapter 5, 14 and through, um, 12 through 14, for through this time you ought to be teachers. You have need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, by reason have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Go to the next chapter, which is in Hebrews, chapter 6, 1, and three, one through 3. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, and a resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now going to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envying, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of God, that you grow thereby, if indeed ye have tasted the Lord is gracious. Now, here it gives a really clear picture of baby Christians. And one of the descriptions of a baby Christian is division. Let that sink in a little bit. It's division. How much of that do we see in our lifetime? According to Paul here, that's a characteristic of a baby. And there's a lot of divisions in church leaders. So is reality that we have spiritual babies leading groups of people? Is that a reality? And we wonder why there's chaos? I'm not sure. Let's, be, let's make this really practical. What age would you say a person is between an age of a baby and a little child. Where does that break in your mind? At four years old? Okay. 18 months? That's when they enter the little child age? Okay, two or three. Okay, this gives a general consensus here. There's different 18 months, four years old, two or three. Okay, we have a, we have a, I just want to, I want to give you a picture. Now, could you imagine a three-year-old leading a group of children and say it's going to flow well? Let's bring a hundred children in here. And the one in charge of the three-year-old. Yes. But how can the three-year-old get the food? I want to give a picture here. A reality in the spirit realm. Do we have three-year-old spiritually leading groups of people and we wonder why it's not working very well? 
because the characteristics in this passage is if there is divisions, it's a characteristic of a baby in Christ. Now, I'm not condemning babies in Christ because every one of us were a baby at one time, physically. When I see the babies on the mom's laps here, every one of us were in that position at one time in our life. All I'm saying is, if we make them to lead, it's going to make chaotic. It's going to be chaotic. There's some more here. In Hebrews 6, I really uh, like this passage, 1 through 3. It gives what the milk of the Word of God is. I mean, it just lays it out so clearly. It's the foundation of repentance. It's a doctrine of baptism, talking about the different baptisms that there is, spirit baptism, water baptism, but baptism by fire, and I believe there's more. A faith to God, laying on a hand, resurrection from the dead of eternal judgment. This is the foundational teaching that I don't think we should despise. But this is, I guess I was really taken back one day. Uh, I, was, I was being accused of not teaching the right things. And literally what was told is, we want more of the basic teaching. And all of a sudden, I, it dawned upon me, I thought these were fairly mature people. But what they were wanting is these elements in Hebrews 6, which was nothing wrong with. But all of a sudden, I discovered that, but who they were. They were babies in Christ. I thought they were mature. But through their desire, but through their language, they showed very clearly where they were at. Uh, some more here is in First Peter 2. If we are struggling with malice, if we're struggling with deceit, if we're struggling with hypocrisy, we should maybe make these more practical. Evil speaking, I believe it's gossip. Envying, wanting something that someone else has. Hypocrisy, being two-faced, saying one thing over here and one thing over there. If this is in our life, In that area of your heart, you're, you're, you're a baby. I don't know how else to say it. But according to these, this passage, it's very clear who the babies are. I mean, it's really clear. Do we care? Do you care if you see this in your life? Does this matter to you? Or this is just the way I am? This is just how it is. This is how my dad was. Or are you going to say, no, I'm going to take responsibility in my life, and I'm going to work on this because I want to mature. Let's not be satisfied. There's nothing wrong with being a baby Christian, but let's not stay there. There's not a mom in here that is, that is satisfied to hold your little one for 10 years. There's not a mom in here that would not be concerned if, like Fanny there, I see you holding your little one. That's great. But 10 years later, the same thing? No, it's not okay. 
It's not okay to stay there. Why are we okay to stay there spiritually? Listen, if we don't deal with these carnal things in our heart, you will stay there. This is the reason we have baby Christians that are 80 years old, because they never dealt with the carnality in their hearts. If you don't deal with the carnality of you in your heart, you will stay a baby Christian. And if you wait till you're my age to deal with it, it's much harder than if you do when you're in your teenage years. Do not wait to get older to deal with the carnality of your heart. The longer you let it in there, the harder it is to get rid of it. Any more comments on this on this stage of maturity that someone likes to share? Are you seeing the the characteristics of a baby Christian according to these verses? To me, it's very clear. Now, going to the next stage. Little children. Again, these are just different verses that you can read. And by reading them right after each other, you can start to get, see a picture. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. <coughs> First John 2, 13, the last part of the verse. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. First John 2, 18, little children, it is your last hour as you have heard of the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that is, it is the last hour. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Now, if you take these passages... And you compare the language to the other one, it's distinctly different. First John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now this is talking about knowing who your Father is, knowing your connection with God. Do you see a progression here? It's not dealing with sin anymore, but it's understanding of who we are in Christ. It's a much greater picture than the babies where it's always struggling, always coming short, always being in divisions, carnal, and things like that. But it has progressed to have overcome those things. Now we're working with our identity in Christ, who Jesus Christ is. Understanding forgiveness is a huge step to learn that we all got to learn. Knowing the Father, that intimacy with the Father, learning how to, how to move from being a slave to a son, I believe is characteristics of a young child, of, spiritually, of the spiritual maturity is learning those things, of who our who our father is.
1 John 2.18 is learning how not to be deceived. What is truth and what isn't? Those are characteristics of a young child. It's not struggling with what you know is wrong, but it's being able to discern, is this from the power of the darkness or is this from God? First John 2.28 is learning to abide in him. How to rest when the world is chaotic and how to rest and be okay. First John 3.18 is not only what we speak, but more what we do. First John 4.4 4 is learning to overcome the evil, not only learning to overcome, but actually doing it. If you're struggling with lust, we actually learn how to crucify that part of our heart and to learn to live above in pureness. 1 John 5, 21, keeping yourself from idols, discerning what is an idol and keeping yourself away from it. When I started seeing these areas, I was like, oh, wow. Most... If people in our society, as far as Christians, can get to the place of little children, those are the leaders. If you can get to that point, you'll probably become a leader. <laughs> because so many are in the little children bracket. I think there's a reason... And this next part is what has been really, really, as a, is the part that I've been seeing from another angle, this next part that I want to share, is when I see a lot of leaders, I see them actually living out the little children's stage. Not all, but some. But now when it comes to the young men, it's like, oh, now this is when the pool gets really small all of a sudden. Why is it such a struggle? I believe most people stop at the little children's stage. Why do you think there's not much movement beyond a little child's stage? Any thoughts? Mine has a shift from inward focus to outward focus. David. They actually like being little children. When it suits. But one thing I noticed. With little children, everything is fine as long as life is working. But as something comes in that is hard to process, that is different... We all of a sudden get lost. I don't know what to do. I've seen this quite a bit. But this is the part that I have seen in the last half year that, that, that God has been opening my eyes to that I never saw before. Is I'm going to make this your soul. I'm just illustrating this as your soul. What I see is the power of darkness can infiltrate your soul to the degree that you have no clue that it's there. And when it moves and operates, it is so intertwined or integrated into your soul that you think it's you. See, when I look at the baby Christians, when it talks about lust, when it talks about 
envy, when it talks about strife, this is something we can pick up. But if we carry generational things, it's not something we choose. It's something that's working in our background that is so intertwined in our soul, it guides our life and we don't realize it. And I'll give you a shocking example of this that someone told me just recently. This young man was working in a children's ministry. And in, his t in that pursuit, he wanted to go deeper with God. And through the through circumstances, he started going to a counselor. And in this time, he loved working with children. He absolutely loved it. And he thought that this love for children was the Holy Spirit working in his life. And in this process of going to this counselor and just wanting, because he wanted to go deeper, he did not go there because he saw a problem in his life. He went there because he wanted to go deeper. And through this, it is the one time in their sessions, the counselor went, do you like little boys? I'm talking in a pedophilia way. And he repented of it. He dealt with it. And all of a sudden, his life changed. The drawn to working with the little boys was all of a sudden gone. Here, whether it was pedophilia, whether it was homosexuality, I don't know. But there was a presence working in his life, drawn toward a direction, and he thought it was the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't. And when he repented of it, it dealt with something in his heart that totally changed the trajectory of his life. So what does it take to deal with those hidden things? There's a comment I often hear. I never experience this because I don't have natural children. How many of you saw a shortcoming in your life come out of your children? This is what I'm talking about. These are hidden things in our souls that are working in the background, that are direct, that are impacting us and totally hidden from who we are. Getting passed from generation to generation to generation to generation. And they're going to keep on going unless someone rises up and deals with it in their own life and in their children's life. It's going to keep right on going. These are the things that I'm talking about. These are, these are, I don't know if they're principalities, I don't know the powers of darkness, I don't know the proper name, but they are, they are in our life, hidden below the conscious and working in our life and affecting us and the next generation. And it's not necessarily, I'm not, I don't believe that these things will keep us from heaven. But we can live above these things, I'm convinced. My question is, how? How do we deal with these hidden areas of our hearts that are dark, that are there, that we ourselves don't know? Is there hope for those areas of our soul? I think there is. No, I said that wrong. I know there is. I'll give you an allegory that's in the scriptures. In Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were facing the fire furnace. They knew if they don't bow, they're going to get thrown into that fire. What was their response? Anyone care to share? Right there, the mic's right there. We won't do it because our God can save us, and even if he doesn't save us, we still won't do it. 
And when they were thrown into the fire, what happened? The fourth man appeared. Fourth man appeared. There's another, there's another key thing that I want to see, Shane. The ropes burned off. The burned off. Now, see, this is a different stage of our souls. If we're at the souls, and I believe this is the stage that we have to go through if you want to become a young man. I'm talking about spiritually. You have to go through the fire. If our parents went through the fire, that is great. But every individual has to go through the fire to burn what's banning them in their hearts in order to get free. If you don't go through the fire, you'll never get free of those deep hidden things in your hearts that are there regardless if you want to believe it or not. If you're a human being, every person has to go through the fire if you want to get loose. I believe this is the key. When I started seeing this, and I, I tend to have, in the past, I tend to have a little bit more of a victim mindset when it comes to God through all the fire that he took me. And it's just how it is. All of a sudden, I started seeing the beauty of the fire is to burn off what is bounding our souls if we're willing to pay the price. Do you see the picture? Are we willing to go through the fire to burn off what's bounding our souls? It's going to cost us. And not only did it, buy, did it burn those ropes of the, of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what was the king's response when it was all over? If I, understand, if I remember correctly, I should have looked this up, but it's more or less, today we're going to serve the Lord, the, the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It broke a principality in that area when they were willing to go through the fire. Are we willing to go through the fire? How bad do we want to mature? I believe it's impossible. Now, this is a personal understanding. I have not found this in Scripture. But I personally believe it's impossible to mature if you're not willing to go through the fire. When I say mature, going from a young, young child's part to the young man part. I see it before, a lot of people crossing from baby stage to little children's stage, but then from little children to young men is where I see a breakdown. And I believe it's because the fire. The fire is extremely intense. This fire I see different than some of the other things. It is a choice to go through that in the process of going through, if you want to exit, you can. But unless you go the whole way through, you, your ropes will not get burned off. I'm convinced of that. You have to go the whole way through if you want the full effect in your soul. Are we willing to take to go there? Yes. Just, just uh, speaking to the mic. So you're saying a lot of times people can jump out of the fire? I personally believe that. When it comes to this fire of burning the... Okay, when I see this connection, and I use this, uh, this illustration just to kind of uh, bring a visual of how darkness can integrate itself so deeply in our souls that it feels as one. And it takes the breaking or fire
to separate the two, and only the Holy Spirit, I believe it's so intense that even ourselves can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can do it. If we yield ourselves to it, if we surrender and say yes, and be willing not only to go through the fire, but to sit in the fire. And that gets so intense, the temptation of our flesh is to jump out. But when we do that, we will miss the full result in our souls if we jump out too soon. Actually, my personal understanding is if we jump out too soon and if we ask God we want to go further, we got to have to go right back into it again till we finish it. You cannot bypass God's method of operation. It's not possible. God's method of maturity cannot be short-roaded. You can't do, do shortcuts. It doesn't work. You have to go through it till you're finished. If you want to choose to do another way, go ahead. But I'm going to tell you now that it's not going to work. The Holy Spirit does not take shortcuts does not take highways. You have to go through it. I believe this is one of the biggest reasons we don't see fathers, spiritual fathers, is because that fire is so intense that jump out of it. I would recommend if you really want to mature that you ask for it. This is the reason I believe it's important to ask for the fire. Because when you go in it, the intensity gets so strong that if you don't want it, if you don't want it bad enough, you will get out. But if you want it, your personal desire got to want it to stay in it. That's why I say it's important that we ask for it. That we come to the place that we actually say, okay, God, I'm willing to go through it again. I want to go further. You ask for it, and the fire, the likelihood of the fire to come, where it hurts for you, is almost guaranteed. Now, I do not realize I'm going to be preaching this long. But I think I do. Is it okay if I finish up? I want to go to the young man's stage now. Young man, Titus 2.6. Likewise, exhort the young man to be sober-minded. 1 John 2.13. I write to you, young man, because you have overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2.14. I have written unto you, I have written to you, young man, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do you see the language here that is different than the little children? It is clearly showing here that you're strong. The word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Do you see the language difference? That is in the little children to hear. It's distinct language difference. You have overcome. You have overcome. The word of God abides in you. You're not wishy-washy. And now going to fathers. Yeah, yeah. 
1 John 2.13. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And actually, when I looked in Scripture and tried to find characteristics of a father, there's hardly anything there. But I think we know what the characteristic of a father is. What I see in young men, they're strong in God. They know who they are. And they have overcome the wicked one, and they're living a victorious life. But now when you go into the, into the father or the mother stage, now all of a sudden life shifts. And it's not about me anymore. It's about them, other people. It's about the babies. It's about giving them a safe place. It's about helping them to mature. It's about giving a safe place to the little children. I believe that's one of the key differences between a young man and a father is, is the part of caring for others around us. What is my encouragement to you? First of all, I'm going to start with the youth. This can be for any, I don't, I'm not sure where the where the line of youth starts and stops here. I don't know. But what I want to encourage you is this journey, and I'm not saying God can't do things faster to some people than others, but I see this journey of coming from a babe in Christ to maturity, uh, at least young men, to be a period of at least about 20 years. And I'm not saying God doesn't move faster in some places. But there's generally a time frame I see. And if we wait till we're 50 to start this journey, I think a lot of years are wasted. Young people, do not waste your time. And I want to I want to really emphasize that growing in maturity is not a waste of time. But don't put off the carnality in your heart. If you see carnality in your heart, deal with it. Cut it off. I think it's in Colossians it says to put aside anger, and it gives a whole list of things. Put aside, cut off those things of your heart, the obvious things. First of all, you have to work with the obvious things. Then you have to get stable. And as you get stable, now you can start dealing with the more deeper part of your heart. And you can come strong. But don't wait till you're older. Start now. In the basic things of life. Get grounded in the Word of God. Learn what it is to walk in obedience, in submission, in honor, in respect. Because this is something that will affect you for the rest of your life. The rest of us, let's not be satisfied where we're at. Let's always be wanting to go further. If we need to go through the fire, let's ask for it. Because the fire is actually, in processing this, the fire is actually a good thing. Who in, our, who in here doesn't want to get freed from our soul the dark parts of our heart? And a lot of this was opening to me is I have the privilege of walking with an, a man that I knew for basically my whole life. 20, 30, 30 years ago, we were very close friends. Then we kind of went our separate ways. And in the last 30 years, he basically lived in compromise. And today, at 50 years old, he's 
he's struggling with these baby characteristics in his life. Why? Like I said, there is no shortcut to maturity. And if we have compromise in our hearts, it's going to hinder us. We cannot mature. It's impossible to mature if we have compromise in our hearts. I believe, it's, I believe it's impossible if we have those dark things in our hearts. It's impossible to mature. It's not possible. We have to deal with these things in our hearts. It's actually not that hard to deal with it if we want to. The Holy Spirit is really good at this kind of stuff if we're willing to surrender. Any other comments someone wants to make? I believe that's all I have. Uh, can you have the mic there? You have a question. You laid out clearly some of the um, stages to go from one to the next, but you, you haven't pointed out from going from a young man to a father. Is that more fire, or what, it, what, what, is, what holds that gap in? Like, what is the bridge? Okay. I will admit, moving from a little child to a young man, that is my current understanding that I'm just going through right now. And I'm like, how did I, mi how did I miss this all my life? I don't know how. But as far as that stage, I had in the clear instructions how that looks like. From me looking at it, for where I'm at is as a young man matures I believe his heart will start looking around to others instead of himself I, I wonder if there's not a, just a, like a progression of going through the fire that you start having a, a generally care for the, for the little ones and want to make a safe haven for them, a safe place for them a greenhouse effect so to say that they can grow up and mature before they go out to, to the real world. But uh, I don't have a clear picture of moving from young man to father stage yet. It might come in the future, but at this moment, it's not really clear for me. Unless someone else has something they can add to that. Go ahead, Aaron. Or don't you have something? Okay. Uh, I was just reminded of David Wilkerson. He went up to New York City to start a church. God showed him to do that. And he said that he believes... His impact from 70 to 80 was greater than from 0 to 70 combined. And I believe that because of where he was walking at that point in life as a father and as impacting, you know, sending devotions out, all the things that he was doing, I believe if we continue to walk with the Lord, we'll be amazed as we get older how much impact it will have because there's something about that age plus maturity. And I'm just using as an as an as a let's don't stop let's keep That's going right. on because there's so much more out there that we've not yet seen and the world needs people that will come alongside the world them needs fathers. with wisdom and, and to be able to nurture and, and shepherd them it is amazing but when you can look around us you can almost pick out the fathers of our day uh, uh, you did one David Wilkerson was one um, Frank Graham's dad what was his name Billy Graham and you can, you can start picking out who the fathers are. But that's how few there are. And I'm not saying there's, a, there's not more. But these are, are clear examples of they lived their life. And they lived their life, and you brought out the point, walk with the Lord. And through this, I actually don't believe we should put our focus on, being, on making sure mature, we're maturing. Let's not put our focus on that. That's right. The focus is on Jesus. That's right. If your focus is on Jesus and you have a yes before him all the time, you will mature. It's a guarantee. But when we start saying no is when this all stops. Jaden, take him the mic. Amen to that. Um, There's, there's a couple of things I'm just trying to think how to start here. Um, anyway, a, a prayer that's good to pray, if, if, if we mean it, is whatever it takes, God, I want to go all the way with you. Right. Yep. Um, uh, one of my friends uh, preached that 
it takes on the average of 30 years for a Christian to learn how to live the life with go- the Christian life with God's strength instead of our own strength. Um, so maybe that kind of fits in here a little bit. Um, so I, I don't know if this is a good time for a song, but I thought maybe there's a little, little chorus that might fit in here. Um, well, why don't you just save that as quick as we're finished talking? We'll do that when we're finished. Sure. But let's, let's come back to that as quick as we're... Any other comments someone wants to make? Uh, I, I, go ahead. The mic is close to you. I'll come over to you, Jake. Kind of answering my own question. Um, as I asked the question and pondered about it, the... Uh, young men versus fathers or what happens you know the stage if you look at uh if you compare it with the natural if if there's a young man uh very clearly there is a big difference between a young man and a father in the natural like if if i look at my boys or someone has a whole row of children and the, uh, the, the children, the older children will pour into the little, little ones. But there is, there is a very distinct difference between who's responsible. Right. And so all of a sudden I was like, that might be part of answering my own question. Is if someone is truly a father, he will hold the responsibility. He will take responsibility. Yeah, he will hold it. He might not be able to solve the problem, but he will continue to hold the responsibility because that's what a father does. You know, no matter what happens, I'm responsible. You can't, you can't separate responsibility from a father. That's right. You're right. We'll be right back to you, Jacob. You so one thing uh, with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had many opportunities to take their yes away. They had to continue. When they, when they said they won't bow, that was a, they had to keep that yes. But then when it actually came, their hands being tied, and they, the king gave them extra opportunity to say no. They had to make more over and over and over choices to keep their yes with God. That, that is very clear. Thank Amen. you for that. That is good, Aaron. I can... Go ahead, Mary. I can testify to that. If you, if you make a decision to keep your yes with God, it's amazing where God will take you through. And you just, you keep it. I mean, I, okay, my experience is from in the last year. Some of you might remember when we had New Year's reservations here. I, I think I said here that, I'm going to keep my yes with God. And it still stands. If I, if I know that I am to do something, that God wants me to do something, that yes is there already. And it's, it's actually very good because it causes you to go on through with it. True. Thank you. One thought I was thinking if the reason we jump out of the fire is it maybe because of our misconception of God and not having faith, like what the end result is going to be? Not having faith that, that God is good. Yeah, that, and uh, also what hurts for us in our soul feels good in our spirit. Like That's right. we can be focused on our soul, our flesh, and when we actually... Like, I don't think it's really fire in the spirit, is it? I see the fire in our soul level. So I think that our, our fear, we get fear and we get lack of faith. That's what Very. I see in my own life. Very good. At the time, it usually doesn't feel the best, but then later you can look back and realize how much good is in it. You still have something to share? What Dad said was pretty much what I was thinking, just compared to the natural and you start taking responsibility. And well, yeah, I mean, it, as a young man, you don't, you don't have that responsibility, and you're more, you're more, like out towards other things. And then once you get married and start having children, your, your mind, sh- your mindset will shift as to what your priorities are. You're right. I 
I want to challenge a little bit of something that you said. Go ahead. Uh, you, were try you were saying that men and women are pretty much equal in this. I mean, you, you, I know you multiple, multiple times you said you don't want to leave the women out of this. But I believe there's, a, a, there's something that a father brings to a home that a woman doesn't. And that is a challenging, a pushing out, a calling higher. See, a, a mom has more of a tendency to, to just love children, to nourish them, to cuddle them, to feed them. And a father is more like you throw them up and you see how high you can throw them and still catch them and they're still fine kind of a mindset. So I, I think America as a whole is a nation where fathers have been absent from the family to a large degree. And I believe that's detrimental to, to the, to the well, well-being of the next generation because they go through life expecting everything to be handed to them. Okay. And they don't, they don't, they're not challenged to where they need to go to be responsible for their future. I agree 100% with you. The angle I was trying, I'm glad you brought that out. The angle I'm trying to bring out is the maturity level. Mm -hmm. The maturity level. What a spiritual father would do is going to be different than a spiritual mother, but they, we both need to mature. Mm -hmm. That's the point I want to bring out. Correct. But the, what their roles will be will be distinctly different, but yeah. distinctly needed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, that I'm glad you brought that out. There is a difference, but the maturity is needed in the, in the mothers as much as the fathers. I'd like you to pray for all that you laid on our hearts that, that we would all continue to grow up in the Lord and unless you had something okay, else you wanted to uh, There was something else. I forget what it was, but uh, Shane. Just a thought real quick. When you were talking about going through the fire, I'm like, well, of course we want to go through the fire. You know, I haven't been. I've been one to jump out of the fire. But when I thought about it, the Lord brought the verse, the end of Hebrews 13, it says, for our God is a consuming fire. So the only way to get close to him is by going through the fire. That's right. You're right. Okay, Jaden, do you have that song you want to, you want to lead? Number 12. Do you want to lead it? Learning to lean. <clears throat> learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Okay, thank you. You say you want me to uh, just pray over the group. Okay. Um. This here, I take very seriously. Because this is not the first time I've been a part of a group when they all stood and said, we want to go deeper. Because this is not a joke. The, the choices to go deeper is very real. So, if you want to go deeper, you can stand with me and we can pray together. And if you say you're not ready in the position where you are, you want to and you say, I'm not ready yet, I'm going to give you that room to stay in you where you're at because I feel this is a personal choice, and depending on where God has us on our journey, we're not, we just say we're not quite ready because of what we're going through. We need to continue there a little bit, and that's fine. I believe we're all in different areas of our life, and uh, for us that say, I'm ready to go deeper, let's pray together. Um, why don't, we all, why don't you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, 
today as we humble ourselves before your throne, we want to thank you who you are, that you're the King of Kings, you're the Lord of Lords, and today we want to know you deeper. We want to go further. We want to mature. We want to grow. And today we say, yes, Lord. We choose to have a yes before your throne. And anywhere you want us to go, we say yes. Give us the strength. Give us the understanding and the courage to continue with a yes before you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.